We're here with Cubs catcher Tucker Barnhart. And uh, Tucker, first of all, welcome to Chicago. Thank you. Welcome to Cubs convention. And as a guy who spent a lot of time in Cincinnati, we know you know what Wrigley Field is like. But in the recruitment process of free agency, what drew you to want to join this organization right now? Sure. Uh, you know, obviously, I think first of all, I'm an Indian. I'm an Indiana guy. I grew up around here. I, I so being close to home has always been a plus. I got super lucky um, in Cincinnati to be home to be very close to home and and, and everything. Uh, but in Chicago, obviously, is just about. The same uh, the same distance uh, from Indianapolis to Cincinnati was so that was that was at the top of the list for me uh, being close to my family. My oldest son's getting ready to start school, so that was that was one thing. Um, and I think I, as I, I'll speak for myself, I think playing, being able to play at the big league level, um, playing for the Cubs for me was like kind of a bucket list thing to do. P- playing every day at Wrigley Field, uh, being able to call that home was something that that I think I. Didn't really get it until free agency, uh, but it was something that was like a bu- like a bucket list thing that I wanted to be a part of an organization that, from everything that I've heard from guys that I play with, have they treat everybody with the utmost respect, and they do they bend over backwards to do everything they can to make you make you comfortable, make your families comfortable, um, and, it, and so it just it, it felt right, it feels right, and uh, I can't be more happy. When we were introduced to you a few weeks back. Um, you mentioned that during the process, you kind of leaned on Wade, Wade Miley, a former teammate of yours, uh, as far as like his experience here. And and you mentioned how he kind of said like, no, he can't pick another organization that does it better. To hear that coming from a guy who was realistically on in this organization for less than a calendar year, did that do anything more to kind of convince you this was the right move to of make? Of course, I, I, I Wade and I have gotten really close. Uh, we got really close in Cincinnati. Um, I value his opinion and what he thinks at the highest level, you know, and, and to hear him say as many good things as he said about, about the organization from the, from the clubhouse staff to the, the traveling secretaries, to the, to the coaching staff, to the trainers. To, and he, I mean, there was no bad thing that he could say or nothing, no critique that he, he could say that they wished that they, that the organization would have done better. And so, I mean, I, I hold that in a high regard and, um, that definitely played a part, um, in my, in my decision, um, as long as well as the other stuff that I mentioned earlier, but it, it was uh, it meant a lot to me for sure. Uh, Jed and Carter in their panel at Cubs convention talked a lot about how in the free agent market it just sort of they looked at ways that they could beat the market right and and defensively I think it's pretty obvious that they thought that was one spot that they could do it. You bring some gold gloves with you. A lot of guys with gold gloves here. How can that impact a game maybe more than just a regular fan will look at it? Like, does defense get underrated in baseball? I think it, I think it has a chance to just because it's not the sexy thing. It's not the three run homer. It's not the, uh, not the, the big hit or whatnot. Um, but I think the way that I look at it, I think that baseball, you sustain periods of winning with pitching and defense. Uh, I think you have to be able to weather the times when your bats get get cold it's inevitable it's going to happen um so i and i think it's as simple as this to me it's like if you pitch and play defense you're going to be in a lot of close games and you hear it all the time that one one pitch one play can change the outcome of the game and that can only happen and that can only be true when you're you're in one and two run games either way and in order to do that you have to pitch and play defense and i think that you can underrate it, I think. Um, I, I think it's, I, I think underrated is a stretch, but I do think it's undervalued at times. Um, and and I'm I'm so excited. I, I texted with with Hosmer when he when he signed. As I mean, we're gonna have gold all over the field, and he said you, you better believe it. So it's it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be cool. I think it, and I think it provides a level of confidence for pitchers that they don't have to be fine. They don't have to punch everybody out. We're gonna punch guys out, no question. But when when you have the ability to you have the Marcus Stroman's of the world that that get ground balls at an extremely high rate, I mean the confidence level that that has to give when there's Gold Glovers all over the field, um, it's got to be got to be got to do something for for your ball club for sure. You've mentioned previously that 2022 wasn't quite the season that you wanted it to be. Um, and reflecting on that and, and trying to you know move forward, obviously with the new team now. What are some of the the things you've tried to work on this off season? Like what are kind of your goals for this off season as far as 
when you once you get to spring training, you are able to kind of start that process of bouncing back. Sure, no, it was absolutely not the season that that, that I wanted to have last year, um, and quite quite honestly, the worst season of my career. Um, but I learned a lot. I, I grew. I grew a lot. Um, Personally, getting out of funks and and learning what what the the warning signs I guess you would call them, in, in terms of what I'm feeling or what things look like when I'm starting to go go when things are starting to struggle a little bit I guess, um, and how to how to recognize those quicker. Um, and I think obviously even even a guy like myself who's been around for a while, I think you still got to learn. You're still constantly learning, right? And um, you know, I, I, I know that, that the player that, that I want to be and I know the player that I have be, have been in my career is is there and is in there. And it's just I, there's a constant growth, I think, that, that you're trying to, t- trying to chase after. Um, so to put like one specific thing that I'm or goal that I'm going, I'll keep that all cl- kind of to myself. But I, I know that this year's last year was going to be just an outlier year for me in, in in a negative way, obviously. But there's a lot of good baseball left, and I'm really happy to be doing it in Chicago. You mentioned growing as a player. There's different rules. A lot of rule changes come in this off season. What do you think of the new rules, and how do you think they will impact the game? Whether it's you know the pitch clock for the batters, whether it's the bigger bases, which I still don't fully understand in my <laughs> head. Either. Like I'm in, I'm envisioning like a big bouncy room out right. of second base. <laughs> no doubt, like, no doubt. Uh, the bases to me, I, I think are just going to be something that nobody really even notices. I, I, I haven't seen what the new bases are going to look like, but I would think that it would have to be like as big as this table for us to really <laughs> like notice that the bases are bigger yeah. or like the old softball base or little league base where yeah. you had the, the red or the orange one that you had yeah. to hit or whatever. Yeah. It would have to be something like that I think um, that's just purely an assumption uh, the pitch clock I think over time and, and I think in spring training all the kinks are going to get ironed out and everything's going to be it's virtually unnoticeable I think once the season starts the one rule for me that that and I probably I know I'm biased because I'm a catcher the the pickoff rule where I guess I don't know the the exact wording of the rule but there are limits to how many times pitchers can pick off um, when guys are on base and being a catcher that puts us kind of behind the eight ball when every base runner knows that the guy's reached his pickoff limit or whatever that is and it's going to be it's going to be chaotic I think there for a start for for at the at the beginning um, in terms of that rule but um, I'm anxious to see how they uh, how they how they go and how they work. I I'm I've always been a guy that like I I use a, an old cliche that my one of my buddies that played the big leagues uses. He's like you don't buy tickets to the opera and expect a heavy metal show, and you don't <laughs> buy tickets to a heavy metal show expecting the opera. So I think there's so many things that that are that are going on, so many rule changes that are being talked about that I think that you, we got to be careful not messing with the integrity of the game because in between inning times and stuff like that, that's really not messing with the game. But the pitch clocks of the world, the the limiting pickoff attempts, I mean, you're starting to mess with it a little little much, in my opinion. Uh, but, again, it's just the world we live in and world we play in, and we'll have to adapt, and we're pretty good at that, I guess. But uh, we'll see. Well, at least having caught Wade Miley in the past, you're a little familiar with the speed. <laughs> right, of no the doubt. Clock, no right? doubt. Um, but as far as the bigger bases go, I, one of the theories that I've seen kind of thrown out there, I guess you don't really know until you do it, but uh, with the, I guess, shortened distance in between bases, you know, guys sometimes stealing second base are out by mere inches, sure. right? Have you thought about that, like how that can affect the way you catch and control the running game as far as if those inches are taken away from you, yeah. you got less a space to g- get a guy out, obviously? Yeah, no doubt. Um I think there, there's just so many there's so many variables that go into throwing guys out. Um, it's time to the plate, where the pitch is thrown, who the runner is, what kind of jump he gets. Now you're throwing another variable in the bases in. So obviously, I think it's going to play a part for sure. Um, but we'll see. I, I I'm a very anxious to get to spring training for a lot of reasons, um, and I'm very anxious. The, one of those reasons is the the changing of the rules and how everybody adapts to that, and uh, it's going to be interesting for sure. Did you use Pitchcom yourself last year, and what did you think of that? Was that we th- we did we um we started we kind of in my opinion and it was I don't it was nobody's fault we just didn't think it was going to take on this or everybody wasn't going to use it right away mm-hmm. but it ended up happening where a lot most every team used it and we didn't. 
but we started to we kind of just said the hell with it and and made the pitchers do it um, the second half of the year. Um, I love it. I didn't like it initially. I thought it was just another gimmick that they were trying to put in the game that was going to alter things. But I think it is a really cool, cool thing. Um, and I think it was it's absolutely necessary now with the pitch clock. I think you you have to. It's just so much faster, especially when there's guys guys on second base. You can't really run through a sign sequence. Um, and if a guy shakes you off, you're going to be – at the at the back end of the uh, at the at the clock really quickly, so I think it's it's a it's a cool thing. Um, I think I heard there's a rumor going around that there's a possibility that a pitcher has a transmitter, so he if he wants to tell you what he's thinking, mm-hmm. he can tell you mm-hmm. or by hitting a button or whatnot. So I, I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, I would like it if it was. Um, I think it would be cool. When you look at this team, and obviously as a catcher, you you are obviously more involved with the pitching staff. Um, the Cubs have built a lot of pitching depth, and especially with starting pitching, um, just from the other side of the ball, you know, behind the plate. What is that excitement level for? What is your excitement level for that? And, and knowing all the um, kind of dependable arms you got on the mound when you're going to be out there. Sure, it's great. Um, I you, you can never have too many too many good arms. You know, I think it's it's inevitable that guys are going to go down. Guys are going to need to skip starts, miss miss starts for for certain things, and you need to have guys that are ready to go um and as many of them as possible so i'm looking forward to meeting all those guys i'm uh, from in the in a baseball setting obviously meeting everybody this weekend but uh having those conversations learning who they are as pitchers i mean you can look at video you can look at numbers but you really it's hard to kind of get a feel or a grasp who a guy is on the mound until you're catching him so like that i think in spring training those those bullpens and the side sessions even in the games those those games are so pivotal so that when we get here to Chicago on opening day, it's we hit the ground running, and instead of having to feel each other out um, when when uh, when it all matters, you know. So it's uh, I'm super excited. I, I we I went and played catch with with guys yesterday. Uh, we had a little workout before before everything last night, um, an optional deal that I went out and just got to meet guys, got to watch them throw and and play catch and talk, and that stuff's big in my opinion. Sure. I, I love to hear that you guys are already throwing. You haven't even made it to Arizona. You're willing <laughs> to th- throw in this weather. Do you think uh, your veteran presence and also Jan, I, I'm curious how well you know Jan, but between the two of you that your veteran presence is something that can really benefit all of the young pitchers that are coming up because it's not just the guys that are on the 40-man now. It's the guys that are coming up after them as well. Like This team is really focused on developing pitching. Uh, the hiring of Chris Breslow really kind of changed Craig, Craig Breslow. Yeah. I'm sorry, changed the um, the trajectory of this franchise sure. for pitching. Like, do you think that you guys can really help them in that way? I think so for sure. I, I, I I've talked with Jan. We exchanged texts and stuff um, after I signed, and just kind of talking about about some of the guys. Um, obviously, talking this weekend. Um, it I. With Jan and I behind the plate, there isn't going to be a situation that comes up that's going to surprise us. It's like we've seen kind of everything there is. Jan um, won World Series. I mean, he's seen everything, right? So um, I'm excited as hell to work with him, uh, to learn from him. I think we both have both have a lot to offer to, to our young guys. I think you have to have, at this day and age in the way baseball is played, I think you have to have two everyday catchers. I really do. And I think that – in any at any time out there, if if it's me or if it's Jan, there's a it's a starting caliber catcher that's in the, that's behind the plate for our, for our team, um, that has the best uh, interest of the, the guy that's on the mound at heart, every game, every inning, every pitch that we want them to do as well as they possibly can. Obviously, um, so I, I think we do. I think we have a lot to offer the, uh, this group of pitchers, um, but we have some vet, we have veteran arms too that we're going to be able to learn from. I think it's everybody consistently trying to get better uh, every day is what's going to get us to where we want to go for sure. Before we let you go, uh, my biggest question, and, and this is the rumor around the Cubs convention, The Dark Knight is your favorite movie. Can you <laughs> yes. confirm or deny that? It is. It's my favorite movie. <laughs> okay, sure. well, then we're going to get along just no fine. No doubt. I love that, it. He, he, he could tell you. I, I have claimed that that is the greatest movie ever made. It's a very, very <laughs> well-made movie. No <laughs> question about it. <laughs> so there we go. We'll get along just fine. Perfect. I have one more question. Sure. If you're an indie guy, are you a St. Elmo's guy? Do you like the the super hot shrimp cocktail? And if so, 
what Chicago restaurants are you looking forward to trying during the season? Because oh we're, you know, we're known for food, obviously. Yeah, that's, that's a loaded question because mm-hmm. I, I am a foodie for sure. My wife and I are foodies. We will try anything, everything, you name it. Um, so to answer your first, the first part of your question, St. Elmo's um, is, is good. The shrimp cocktail is good. Um, it's not my favorite spot. Um, I think the the um, it, the steaks are are good. The shrimp, if you go there, you're going for the shrimp cocktail for sure. Um, but the second part of the question, we've had a lot of very good food in Chicago already, just traveling in. Um, so I, I'm excited just to continue to learn about the city and try new spots. Um, I'm a big fan of trying new restaurants, uh, new types of food, new cuisine. So uh, there isn't one that sticks out in my head that, that, I mean, I've been to Alinea, we've been to the the RPMs, uh, we've been to Gibson's, we've been, we've done, we've done everything that, that has been talked about at when we've traveled in here. Uh, But I'm looking forward to finding the holes in the wall and pizza spots and stuff like that. Well, then real quick, speaking of food, you're not on the Reds anymore. Skyline Chili? Terrible. <laughs> there you go. I don't mind saying I said it when I was in Cincinnati. <laughs> okay. I think it's terrible. That's all I need to hear. <laughs> you put noodles in your chili, like spaghetti yeah. noodles in your chili. I'm, I'm out. I'm so you, you got better food out here. For sure. <laughs> we're we're going to like you. We're going to like you for sure. Thanks for coming on. You bet, man. Thanks for having me.